This evening, uh, we are back to um, our study on the uh, Ten Commandments. So I'd ask you, uh, well, either to turn in your Bibles or to um, follow along on the screen behind me as we read Exodus chapter 20 in verses uh, 4 through 6. And this is the second commandment, uh, the commandment we believe the Lord has given us to teach us how we are to worship Him by way of negative example, how we are not to worship Him. But this is what uh, the Lord tells us in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. He says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. <coughs> May the Lord bless his uh, word to our hearing this evening. Now we know, as we've already seen, that God's uh, love, <coughs> excuse me, calls us to devote ourselves completely to him. Now, we saw as much in the first commandments where the Lord calls us not to have any other gods before him. Basically, what he means by that is that we are not to love anything more than we love God. Nothing must even be a close second to him, not even those who are closest to you. You know, one thing we, we really need to be careful about, and perhaps we can look at this um, well, down the road to the various commandments, is that if we are tempted uh, to love anyone or anything, and I think especially in terms of, of our relationships with one another, and I think especially guarding ourselves in our marriages, and especially when we're young, is that we are not to, um, to love our spouse or even a potential spouse anywhere near how much we love the Lord. That needs to be true, and if we do love them more, well, then something is radically out of balance. We need to guard our hearts and make sure we love Him most of all. And you do need to remember that God is not asking you to do this without first uh, giving you something by which, um, well, He has actually earned this love. I mean, what more can the Lord do for you than He's already done to command your love? Again, thinking about the fact that God is the one who gave you existence. God is the one who sustains you. And even when you were downright his enemy, when you rebelled against him, yet the Lord had compassion and he sent his son into the world to die for you in order to redeem you, not only from the guilt that would have sent you to hell, but also from the power of sin that made you rebel against him in the first place. Uh, what you owe God, of course, is your entire heart, your entire life. That's the reason why uh, we're looking at a study of how we are to devote ourselves entirely to the Lord, because He deserves that kind of love from us, and far more than we could ever possibly give Him. Now, tonight we're going to consider that when the Lord tells us to love Him, the first commandment again tells us that that's what we must do, when he tells us to love him most of all, he doesn't mean to simply love him any way that we please. He means that he wants you to love him in the way that he calls you to love him. You know, those who do uh, marriage counseling, by the way, they know how important it is that a husband and wife be able to communicate their love to one another. And many couples basically go into marriage thinking that if they just do that in a way that makes sense to them, uh, that if they, if they in their heart are doing the things they're doing in order to show love to their spouse, that their spouse is automatically going to see that and acknowledge that as love and receive that. Now, that's certainly true when it comes to the basics of affection, you know, that uh, have to do with showing love to one another. Certainly, those things can't very easily be misunderstood. But there are other areas in which we attempt to show love to our spouses and maybe even work hard at doing that only to discover later that our spouse has been looking at our lives trying to figure out whether we love them or not uh, through the things that we're doing because they don't understand that what we're doing we're doing out of love. Now, the point of that is that 
you need to find out from your spouse what actually communicates love to them, what, what they would like to see from you if you're going to communicate effectively uh, in a language that they will understand and receive as love. Now, not surprisingly, in a similar way, the same thing holds true for God. I mean, God, too, is a person, and he wants to be loved in a particular way. And if we are to love him and show him love, or if that's what our desire is, we have to do it in a way that he will accept. Now, that's true more narrowly as we meet together to worship, because what is worship except to show our love to the Lord? And it's true more broadly as we seek to show the Lord that we love him by living a life that is pleasing to him. Now, that is what I believe the second commandment is really all about, that we worship him or show him love and honor and respect in the way that he desires, in the way that he will accept. So tonight, I'd like for us to look at two things. The first one is how we are to worship the Lord or how we are to show him love. And secondly, well, several of the reasons why we ought to worship him and love him in the way that he commands. And we've already seen one of those ways, but um, we'll look at some others. Now, first of all, let's consider how we are to worship or how we are to love the Lord. And I'm I'm using those terms basically synonymously. Uh, the only worship that God is going to accept is that which comes from the heart. And certainly if you are to love him, you have to give him the worship that he requires. Worship is simply loving God, is simply showing love to him in the way that he commands. Now, why is it that we can't just worship the Lord or basically love him any way that we want to do that? Well, it's because that uh, God, being holy and righteous as he is and having the authority to require what he wants, tells us that he wants us to worship him. He wants us to show our love to him in a particular way. If the Lord hadn't said that, perhaps it would be open to maybe what we would like to do, but the Lord has told us specifically what he wants us to do, and I believe the second commandment actually addresses that. Now, I do believe it addresses more narrowly what worship is, but again, understanding that the Lord has summarized everything that he requires of us in the Ten Commandments, that it's in this commandment that, as we've already seen from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it really is meant to control our whole lives. You know, we, we often refer to the Second Commandment in our circles as the regulative principle Basically, we are to worship God the way he calls us to worship him. And we apply it to uh, the worship that we do on the Lord's Day when we meet together. But we need to understand that that applies not just to what we're doing here, but it applies to all of life. The second commandment addresses how we are to love the Lord, how we are to show him the honor and the glory that is his. Now, one thing I want you to see, though, regarding this commandment, as well as several of the other commandments, is that the Lord tells us how to do it in a negative way, we might say, rather than positive. And as I thought about this, I had to ask myself the question, why is it that the Lord couches the majority of his commandments in a negative way? Why does he tell us positively what he wants us to do? Well, I think he does this for at least two reasons. First of all, he knows us very well. And he knows that we're much more likely, the tendency within us, even as redeemed you know, believers, is, is to go in the wrong direction. It's the reason why we saw this morning, the Lord often brings affliction. Uh, he needs to put pressure on us to get us to change because our hearts keep wandering and going the wrong way. And so he tells us uh, more often what not to do rather than what to do. As I've said, most of the commandments are actually expressed in this way. You shall have no other gods before me. God is saying, I want to be first in your life. Uh, you shall not make for yourself an idol, rather than you shall worship me in the way that I tell you in that way only. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet the things that belong to your neighbor. You know, there's only two commandments that are actually listed positively. Honor your father and your mother. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's interesting that even in the explanation of the Sabbath, he, there's still an, you know, a negative statement. On it you shall do no work. Again, because of the tendency of our hearts, because we're so apt to go the wrong way, the Lord puts these things in terms that we're going to see uh, more immediately. But I do think in the context, there's a reason why the Lord uh, put it this way, especially this commandment, to his people when he gave them uh, the Ten Commandments originally. It's because he was speaking to a people that had just come out of an idolatrous nation and a people who were about to enter a nation that was full of idolatry. You know, the Lord gave his commandments, the Ten Commandments, twice. You know, you find it twice in your Bible. You find it in Exodus um, chapter 20. And you also find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now, in Exodus 20, he's given it to a people who has just come out of the land of Egypt, out of an idolatrous land. In Deuteronomy 5, he is speaking to a new generation that is about to go into Canaan, again, into a land where there were you know, uh, people who worshipped idols. God wanted to be sure that his people not worship him in the way that the people of those nations worship their false gods. He did not want them to make an image of him and then attempt to worship him through this. Now, were the people of God ever tempted to do this? Well, of course they were. The first thing they did when they came out of Egypt, when Moses went up onto Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights to receive the commandments of the Lord, was they made a golden calf, and they began to worship it. Now, you might say, well, what did that have to do with, with the worship of God? Didn't they fall into idolatry? Well, yes and no. Because when they made the golden calf, they said that this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is the true God. And they proclaimed a feast to, not to this uh, golden calf or to the gods of Egypt, but they proclaimed a feast to Yahweh, which God had revealed to them was his covenant name. In other words, they built this calf and they attempted to worship God through it. Now, what did God think about this? Well, if you've read the story lately, you know that Moses took that idol and he ground it into powder he put it into the water and he made them drink it, for one thing. And then he had the Levites who hadn't uh, apostatized to this golden calf strap on a sword and go through Israel and they killed thousands in the judgment of the Lord. God tells us he wants to be worshiped in a particular way. I think we ought to listen to him. Now, do we have any other examples in scripture of those who try to worship the Lord in a way that he had not commanded? As a matter of fact, uh, we do. A couple of rather striking examples. In one instance, the Levites. There were, there were several families of Levi, several children of Levi, and, and uh, you know, families within that particular tribe. The Lord had actually called Aaron and his children uh, and set them apart to be priests of the Lord. But on one particular occasion, there were several who thought, well, why should Aaron's sons be the only ones who can stand before the Lord and act as priests? Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and on. And they said, we think we should be able to do what Aaron's sons did. So Moses says, well, why don't you take your incense censers and appear before the Lord at the tent of meeting, and we'll see what the Lord has to say about that. Well, that's exactly what they did. And as they appeared before the Lord with their incense censers burning, fire came out of the tent of the Lord and burned them all up so that all that was left were the incense censers on the ground, which they collected up and put back in the tent of meeting. And at the same time, an earthquake took place in the camp of Israel, and the ground opened up and swallowed their tents and their families and everything that belonged to them. And then, they, well, Scripture says they went alive into Sheol, which means into the grave, and then the ground closed up, and that was it. Did God approve of, of their, their ideas, of their innovations? No. And then there was one other instance which you've heard me refer to before as well, and that's where Aaron's two sons 
Nadab and Abihu decided on one particular day as they're worshiping the Lord to put together a mixture of incense which God had not told them to do. He said, I want you to use this mixture. He didn't say not to use this mixture, but he said, this is what I want you to do. But they did this instead. And so they offered this incense on the altar of incense. And fire came out from the altar and killed them. Again, now, in the Old Testament, it seems like the Lord was much more explicit about these things. When, he, when they did something that, that he didn't approve of, he showed them right away. We might say in the New Covenant, perhaps the Lord is being more gracious to us than he was in the Old Covenant. I, I think that's certainly true in many instances. But the question we might ask is, why did God do this? Why did he judge them so severely? Well, actually, the Lord did give an explanation in one instance, and that is after he killed the two sons of Aaron. We read in Leviticus 10, I believe it's in verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, who had just lost his two sons, therefore kept silent. We do need to realize that God is not our peer. God is not our buddy. God is God, and God is holy, and he's infinitely holy, and he will be treated as holy by his people, and he also will be honored by his own as well as by all men. When God says to do something, we need to do what he says. I hope you understand that. It's what he calls us to do. We must do it because that's what he wants. That's what he's going to accept. And if we are going to love him, that's what we're going to give him. If we love him, that's what we're going to want to give him because he's already told us this is what he wants. And so when it comes to the worship of God, we are not to be innovative. Rather, we are to do what God has called us to do to praise him, to honor him and to glorify him, to show our love and devotion to him. We will do what he commands. God basically tells us in, in his word that when we meet together, we are to read his word. His word is to be preached. It is to be received. It is to be remembered. It is to be applied. We'll sing praises to him. We'll sing, we'll sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We are to pray to him, and we are to receive the sacraments. When the situation requires it, we will fast before the Lord and seek him more earnestly. And when the Lord hears our prayers and, and does what it is we're seeking him for, we will give him thanks and praise. We will do this because this is what he wants. We will do this because we love him because God has shown us so much mercy. Now, this, this is our worship of the Lord, let's say, more narrowly considered as we meet together to worship him. But now, how will we worship the Lord more broadly? Well, we will show him through our lives uh, that holiness that he desires of us. We will live in the way that he commands us to live. Now, this is one of the reasons why the Lord gave us the commandments. Not the only reason, but one of the main reasons is to show us how to live a life that is pleasing to him. I once read a book. It was written by John Stott. It had to do with the Sermon on the Mount, I believe it was. But he made this one particular comment, which the college I was going to at the time didn't agree with. He says, the commandments point us to Christ in order that we might be justified. In other words, it is our tutor to lead us to Christ. It shows us our sin in order that we might be saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. But then Jesus Christ points us back to the law in order to teach us how to live. In other words, these commandments are not only to scare us, as it were, into the kingdom of heaven. These commandments are to be our rule of life. The Lord shows us how we are to live and how to please him and how to to love him. So if you want to show the Lord that you love him, if you want to worship him in a way that he's actually going to accept, 
If you want to live your life in a way that is pleasing and honoring to him, to show him the glory and honor that's his, you have to do it according to the commandments because the commandments actually define what love is, how we are to love God and how we are to love our neighbor. It doesn't matter what we think we're doing. I mean, there are people who say they love God, but they don't do what he commands. Are they really loving him? Well, not according to the Lord. The only way we can show him love is by doing what he commands. So if you're going to love him, you've got to do it his way. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I think he means by there is that, you know, if we love the Lord, we will have a respect for what he says. We will honor him by doing what he commands us to do. But this can also mean if you love me, you'll have to do it in a way that's acceptable to me. And that the only way that's acceptable is through the commandments because they define love. We had a conversation like this at lunchtime. I mean, how do we know how to love God? We can only know it by what he tells us is loving toward him, what is honoring to him. So how are we to love the Lord? How are we to worship him? It has to be in the way he commands, both narrowly and broadly. Our whole lives are to be devoted to him in this way. Now that moves us to the second point. Why should you do this? Why should you love God in the way that he commands? We've already seen a couple of very good reasons, because if you don't do it, if you don't do it the way he wants you to do it, then you're not really loving him, because that's the only way that, that will show him the honor and the respect and the love that you're hoping to show him is through the commandments. You should also do it because there's some pretty serious consequences when you don't do it his way, when you try to show God love in some other way, um, especially when it comes to worship, and again, those consequences, I believe, really apply to those who you know, uh, know better. They know what God wants, but in spite of understanding what God wants, they give him something else. I think that's one of the reasons why God shows so much mercy today. So many churches that do other things, perhaps they just really don't know what they're doing. And of course, we've seen that you should do it because this is what he commands, but I want you to see there is one more reason in the commandment itself as to why you should worship him the way he wants you to worship him. And it's because of the consequences that will fall upon your households if you don't. Notice what he says here again in verses 4 through 6 of Exodus 20. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. I do believe that there are consequences, both positive and negative, although we don't usually think of positive consequences, but we'll, we'll use it in that sense just to make it easier. Positive and negative. There can be negative consequences. God will visit our sins on the third and the fourth generations if we hate him. But positive consequences, he will show loving kindness to thousands, not just the thousands of people or thousands of offspring, but thousands of generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, if, now think about this for a minute. Now, if you know what God wants from you, how he wants you to love him, how he wants you to worship him, but you purposely set aside what he wants you to do, not, not ignorantly, but willingly, then what are you actually doing to him? Are, are you loving him if you do that? No. Well, then what are you doing? Well, you're actually hating the Lord. You're actually proving to be his enemy because that's what rebellion is. When we know he wants us to do one thing, but we do something else. Now, according to this, if we do hate the Lord and seek to worship him in a way that he has called us not to, if we seek to live in a way that is contrary to the way he wants us to live, if we are rebels against the Lord, he says it will 
it will prove to be, well, actually it will mean consequences, bad ones, on your children. Your sins, he says, will be visited on them. Now, is what the Lord's saying here, is he saying that he will punish your children for the sins that you commit? You know, there's another passage of Scripture where the Lord tells us plainly that he's not going to punish the children for the sins of the fathers, but each person would punish for their own sins. So is what the Lord telling us he's going to do here, is it going to be to visit our sins upon our children, contrary to what he says elsewhere in his word? No, I don't think that that's what he's saying. The Lord will not punish them for your sins, but that doesn't mean that God will not punish them for their own sins, which is something he may very well do. I believe what the Lord has in mind here is simply this, that if you hate the Lord and rebel against him and you don't give him what he wants, you don't love him, you don't serve him, you don't worship him with your life in the way he calls you to, then the Lord will withhold his mercies that he otherwise may have given to the children of godly parents. In withholding that mercy, which, you know, I mean, just, just look at when the Lord cuts off a particular branch in the Old Testament, like, uh, well, you know, there was um, Isaac who had Jacob and Esau. And uh, Esau rebelled against the Lord. And look at the consequences upon him and his children. They were fairly severe. Jacob served the Lord. And look at the blessings the Lord brought upon him. If the Lord withholds his mercy from a particular line and visits their sins upon them, uh, the consequences can be devastating. The Lord says here that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Do, do our actions have consequences for our children? According to scripture, it certainly does. But it works both ways. They can be negative consequences or they can actually be positive ones. Because on the other hand, if you worship the Lord as he commands you to do, if you really love the Lord and seek to serve Him and devote your life to Him, He says that He will visit His loving kindness on your children to the thousandth generation. Now, we do have to be careful what, how we understand this, too, because does this mean that a thousand generations after you, are, they're all going to be saved? Does that mean they're all going to be Christians? Well, no, not necessarily, because we know the Bible says that no one is saved apart from faith and repentance. They must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from their sins. But I do think that it does mean that the Lord will have some regard for your children and that he will deal with them in, in his mercies. I mean, God was still dealing even during the time of the gospel dispensation. Well, this is the gospel dispensation. But after Israel had rejected the Lord, he still had regard for the children of Abraham he says that even though they're enemies for your sake because of the gospel, yet they're beloved for the sake of the fathers, God still had regard for them. God was still dealing with them and actually may yet still be dealing with them, perhaps. But one thing I do believe that this also means, perhaps in his caring for them, he will also make sure the gospel comes to them. He will show them his mercies, even to a thousand generations. I don't think it'd be too far-fetched to say that uh, among the offspring of those who have loved and served the Lord, that perhaps a greater majority of them will be saved than among those who hate the Lord. It's not saying that God's not going to save anyone down the line of people who hated the Lord. Perhaps some of you came from households that, you know, he had maybe parents that didn't know the Lord, and perhaps their parents didn't know the Lord, and the Lord decided to have mercy upon your particular generation and saved you. I mean, the Lord certainly does that. He did that among the Gentiles. They were in absolute darkness until the Lord turned to them in his mercy. He can break that curse. But the Lord also shows and is pleased to show mercy down generations of those who actually love him and serve him. And it's important to those who love him and serve him that the Lord would do that. And that's something I think we ought to be praying for as well. If you love the Lord, I hope before you, you know, had any children, you were praying for those children and perhaps for the children's children and so forth, that God might have mercy upon them. So again, the consequence is positive and negative. Another very powerful uh, reason why we ought 
to worship the Lord as he calls us to worship him, to live the kind of life that he calls us to live him or to live for him. And not just any way he please or any way we please. And really, I don't see anything in scripture that really indicates that this command or this promise is no longer valid. I do believe that we need to take this to heart. Now, one final word I just want to give. We've already seen how it is we are to worship the Lord as far as meeting together. It's got to be according to his word. And how we are to worship God with our lives. We are to do it according to God's word. I mean, really, all the commandments tell us how we are to do that. But one thing that I want to close on is, is simply this, that this promise of blessing if we will love and serve the Lord in this way, again, only applies, like all the rest of the promises, only applies to those who have trusted the Lord and have turned from their sins. It doesn't apply to anyone else. Uh, if you don't trust the Lord, if you haven't turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, well, then you automatically fall into the category of those who hate him. And the Lord, the only promise the Lord actually gives to you is to judge you for your sins when you die, and to judge your posterity, to visit your sins on the third and the fourth generations. And maybe not show mercy to any of them. That's entirely in his hands. That is the only promise that you can be sure of if you do not trust the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want these blessings, you actually do have to trust him. This applies to those who will love him and keep his commandments. And his first commandment is repent of your sins Trust, he says, in my son and begin to follow him, submit to him, serve him, and love him. If you want the blessing of the Lord, not only for yourself, but also for your children, this is where you need to begin. You first have to turn from your sins, trust in the Lord, and then begin to follow him. And again, remember, this isn't something that you do in your own strength. This isn't something you decide to do one day. I'm just going to go through the motions and that's going to be enough. It has to be from the heart. And the only way it can be from the heart is if God by his Holy Spirit changes your heart. So if you haven't trusted the Lord, make sure you look to him, ask him for his mercy. Ask him for the spirit to change your heart in order that you might love him the way he calls you to love him, that you would desire to do it in this way, desire to trust the Lord, desire to submit to him and follow him. Well, may the Lord in encourage us uh, through his word this evening to do this. Again, first commandment tells us that we must love the Lord most of all. Second commandment tells us that if we are to do this, we have to do it in the way that he tells us to do it. God doesn't want us just to walk around with a warm feeling in our heart regarding what we think about him and then just live the way we want to live. If we really love him, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. If you really love God, you will submit to those commandments. You will live the way he calls you to live. You will worship him in the way he calls you to worship him. I hope that's, that's fairly clear. May God give us the grace to do that, especially in light again of his great love and mercy for us, which he reveals to us again at the table. Well, let's, uh, let's take just a few moments and, and bow in silent prayer. And let's ask that the Lord would give us the grace to take to heart uh, what he has uh, shown us this evening.